So this lecture is part of a Galois um, theory course and will be about the discriminant of a field extension k contains an m which we're going to assume is finite. Um, so we first recall that if v is a vector space over k, again finite dimensional, suppose it's got a symmetric bilinear form. Then we can define the discriminant of this form as follows. What we do is we pick a basis v1 up to vn of v and we look at the matrix um, whose entries are just all the inner products v1, 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 v2 and so on v2, v1 whatever and the determinant of this matrix is called the discriminant of the bilinear form. Well there's a bit of a problem because it depends on the choice of basis. Um, suppose you choose a new basis w1 up to wn, how, how does the discriminant change? Well um, the um, new basis w, let's just write w for the for the collection of all wi's, is given by A times V for some um, non-singular matrix A. Um, and you find the discriminant with respect to V is, sorry, with respect to W, is then equal to A squared times the discriminant with respect to the basis, um, with respect to the basis V. Yeah, so rather easy calculation. So the discriminant is a well-defined element of um, k up to multiplication by elements of the squares of non-zero elements of k. So if the discriminant is non-zero then it's a well-defined element of the group of elements of k modulo the squares of elements of k. So it gives you an invariant of a symmetric bilinear form which doesn't quite take values in non-zero elements of k but in non-zero elements of k modulo squares. Um, so um, obviously if we've got a field extension then we have a bilinear form on M defined by um, um, a, B is the trace of A, B. You remember we defined the trace of an element of M in the previous lecture just to be its, its trace as a linear transformation on M. So uh, we, we now have the following problem. Calculate the discriminant of M. We should really say the discriminant of the extension M over K but Let's be sloppy and not bother mentioning k all the time. Um, well, um, first of all, the discriminant can be zero. And um, th th this is a slightly unpleasant thing if the discriminant is zero. Um, and if something unpleasant is going on, you've probably got an inseparable extension. And indeed, if you look at the in standard inseparable extension, um, so... Um, if we take the field of all rational functions in T over some field K prime characteristic, it's got a subfield generated by T to the P. And you can check the trace for this is always zero. So in particular, the bilinear form is identically zero and the discriminant is zero. And that's, that's not so nice. But what we're going to do is to prove that it's always non-zero <coughs> for separable extensions. So suppose um, M is separable over K and, and it's finite of course. So um, by the primitive element theorem M is equal to K of alpha for some element alpha. And alpha has a minimal polynomial 
So alpha to the n plus a n minus 1, alpha to the n minus 1 and so on plus a 0 is equal to 0. So this is going to be the minimum polynomial. And we remember a polynomial also has a discriminant. There's a discriminant of a polynomial given by the product of alpha i minus alpha j all squared, where this is a sum over i less than j, and the alpha i are the roots of the polynomial. Um, and what we're going to do is to show that the discriminant of this extension is more or less the same as the discriminant of a polynomial. Um, well, the discriminant of a polynomial is an element of the k, and the discriminant of the extension is only an element of k modulo squares, so they're not quite the same, but we mean the obvious thing that the discriminant of the extension is the image of the discriminant of the polynomial under the obvious map. So let's calculate the discriminant of um, k of alpha. Well, we have to pick a basis for m as a vector space over over k. And there's a really obvious basis. We're just going to take 1 alpha, alpha squared, up to alpha to the n minus 1. And doing anything else would be kind of perverse. Yeah, n is, of course, the degree of m over k. So um, the, um, the discriminant is then going to be the determinant of the following matrix. We take the trace of um, 1, the trace of alpha, trace of alpha squared, trace of alpha, trace of alpha squared, and so on. So we just take a matrix whose um, um, elements are traces of various powers of alpha, because the, here, here the, the basis is given by vi equals alpha to the i minus 1, so what we want is the trace of vi vj which is just the trace of um, alpha to the i plus j minus 2. So we, we're getting this matrix here. Um, and the trace of alpha to the n is just um, the sum of um, alpha i to the n, where alpha i are the roots of our polynomial p. The roots need not be in m, so we should really take k contained in m, contained in some splitting field, and the roots will lie in this splitting field, not in m, but that doesn't really matter. Um, so, um, if we write the trace of alpha as the sum of alpha to the n, our Discriminant is the determinant of the following polynomial. We take sum of alpha i to the 0, sum of alpha i to the 1, sum of alpha i to the 1, sum of alpha i squared, and so on. So we, we just have a big matrix whose uh, entries are sums of powers of the roots. So, so, so these, these sums are just over all roots of the polynomial. And we can factor this as follows. It's just a product of this matrix. And so by this matrix, so um, here the, 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 the columns are just powers of the roots, and here the rows are just powers of the roots. And now you recognize these matrices. These are just the van der Mond matrices. And their values are plus or minus the product of i less than j of alpha i minus alpha j. There's some sort of sign in the van der Mond matrices that I can never actually remember. But it doesn't really matter what the sign is because we're squaring the van der Mond matrix. So um, each of these is given by this expression. So this matrix here is just the product of i less than j of alpha i minus alpha j all squared, which is the discriminant of the polynomial uh, that, that, that's the minimal polynomial of alpha. So we've shown that the discriminant of a field extension is almost the same as the discriminant of, a, of the minimal polynomial of something generating a field extension. Um, in particular, if m over k is separable, 
This implies that alpha i is not equal to alpha j for i not equal to j, of course. So the discriminant, which is the product of alpha i minus alpha j all squared, is non-zero. So the bilinear form trace of a um, given by a b equals trace of a b is non-singular. Um, and it's not difficult to check that conversely if the trace is non-singular then the extension is separable. Um, so that's the discriminant of a field extension. Now, now let's give um, a few applications of it. So the first example says are the fields um, let's take Q of alpha and Q of beta isomorphic where um, um, let's take alpha cubed plus alpha plus 1 equals 0 and beta cubed plus beta minus 1 equals 0. And in general it can be quite difficult to tell whether or not two fields are isomorphic. I mean is, is there some polynomial in beta satisfying the equation for alpha. Well, you would guess there probably isn't. It seems rather unlikely, but can you actually prove it? Um, well, we can just calculate the discriminants. So you recall the discriminant of x cubed plus bx plus c is minus 4 b cubed minus 27 c squared. So we can work out the discriminant of these. these. This uh, the discriminant is equal to minus 4 minus 27, which is minus 31. Here, the discriminant is minus 4 plus 27, which is equal to 23. So these two fields are not isomorphic because the discriminants are um, different. And you notice these have to be different in q star modulo q star squared. You can't just say they're, they're different as integers, you have to say they're not, that the, 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 their ratio isn't the square of a rational number. Um, in fact the discriminant turns out to be a fairly powerful means of telling whether finite extensions of the rationals are isomorphic or not. Um, there's a theorem in algebraic number theory that says that for a given discriminant um, there are only a finite number of um, algebraic number fields with that discriminant. A actually, in that theorem, the discriminant is a slightly finer invariant um, because you can take the ring of integers of an algebraic number field and look at the discriminant of that, and that will actually be a well-defined integer, not just a not just something modulo squares. Um, by the way, it's, 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 it's not actually a complete invariant. For example, suppose we take the three algebraic number fields Q alpha, Q beta, and Q gamma, where alpha cubed minus 18 alpha minus 6 equals 0, and beta cubed minus 36 beta minus 78 equals 0, and gamma cubed minus 54 gamma minus 150 equals 0. These all have discriminant um, 22356, but they're all different um, as fields. But this seems to be a fairly rare phenomenon as far as anyone has calculated. Um, so for the next question, let's look at this field um, Q of alpha, where alpha cubed plus alpha plus one is equal to zero, and ask the following problem, what are the algebraic integers in the field? Well, the algebraic integers contain z of alpha, because alpha is obviously an algebraic integer, and the question is, are there any other algebraic integers um, not not, not in this field. And this isn't, you remember, this is in general a, a rather subtle question. For instance, if you, if you take beta 
squared plus 3 equals 0, then the algebraic integers are strictly bigger than z of beta, because the algebraic integers, as we saw last time, are actually contained in z of um, minus 1 plus root minus 3 over 2. So we sometimes need to use fractions to get all algebraic integers. Well, we can use the discriminant in order to, in order to identify the algebraic integers here, because um, let's look, look, look at the discriminant with the basis 1 alpha alpha squared is minus 31. Um, and suppose that the actual ring of algebraic integers is bigger. So we've got z of alpha is contained in the algebraic integers. And this might have a basis, say, 1, beta, and gamma. And in this basis, we will get some... We, we can work out the discriminant of this basis. Well, um, um, we can write 1, alpha, and beta in terms of the, of the basis 1, beta, and gamma using some matrix A. So, so we would... Um, and th th then we find the discriminant using the basis... Sorry, 1, alpha, alpha, squared. The discriminant using the basis 1, alpha, and alpha squared is equal to the determinant of A squared times the discriminant using the basis 1, beta, and gamma. Um, so uh, the problem is that this discriminant is minus 31, which is square-free. So the determinant of A has to be plus or minus 1. So in other words, um, you, you can't find a strictly bigger ring of algebraic integers containing um, this ring here because the discriminant is square-free. So z alpha is all algebraic integers in Q of alpha. Well, you may wonder what happens if the discriminant isn't square-free. Um, well, if the discriminant contains a square factor, then it can be really quite difficult to work out the full what the full ring of algebraic integers is. Um, and for that, you can see a course on algebraic number theory. OK, um, so the next lecture, we will be looking at a famous theorem called Hilbert's Theorem 90. And I'll explain where this rather unmemorable name comes from.